last time we the last time we talked about the, the the two verses together four and five from chapter 10 and it was about the the 20 qualities of the divine in, inside of us and the Prabhupada explained them so nicely and I won't repeat but uh, but what we what we remembered from last time was that we need to understand how the divine flows through those qualities. That's what we tried to explain yesterday uh, last time. How the, the qualities in us, the 20 qualities that come in this verse, are actually expansions of qualities of God, of of Mohan. Everything that's in our soul is an expansion of the Arada Mohan. And these, this verse, these 20 qualities can help us to understand in what way those qualities we have express divinity. You remember, you can look back at the list yourself. There was intelligence, knowledge, freedom from doubt, etc. Et so the list was really a kind of a, a, a catalog of what we share with God. It's a map, a map of all the qualities of our friendship with God. Remember what's special about bhakti, our tradition, is that God is not a dictator. God is a friend. Krishna and Arjuna, the whole Bhagavad Gita is a conversation between friends. And in many ways, Bhagavad Gita is a book about what a friend is. What it means to be a friend with God. Just an extraordinary thought. Such, such love that Radha Mohan has to let us be friends with, with him. Such an such a generosity. So the twenty qualities in the verse were about what being in a friendship with God looks like. What what God's love for us looks like when we feel it in our own hearts. It's a it's a it's a catalog about how we love about how we love God, yes. But this is a model for how we love each other too. I believe deeply, I believe deeply that what we learn about prema, divine love, reflects in our ordinary love. Or to put it differently, our ordinary love is already divine. So when you when you kiss your husband or you you hug your brother, when you pass your hand over the head of your child, there's divinity in you that's coming out. In every way you love, there's a tiny bit of divine love. Manjari Bhav means doing everything in your daily life to increase that love. 
And what's beautiful is that you know how. You don't need me to tell you. Loving is the most natural thing of human beings. So bhakti, you could say, is a story about being yourself, about realizing that you're already a divine lover. And then letting that happen in your life. <laughs> um, so today we'll put, continue with verse 6 and now we're starting um, a, a sequence of verses which are really very important and really very very powerful maybe starting with verse 8 it really gets to the heart of Bhagavad Gita and and really at last the reason why Gurudev instructed me to, to read Bhagavad Gita with you is to come to this place. So verse 6 goes on, it talks a little bit more about um, Parampara, so about our, the tradition and about uh, the genealogy of, of um, Vaishnavism. So it says in the sun's it Maharashya Sapta Purve Chatvaro Mahavastata Madbhava Manashayata Yesam Loka Ima Prajaha. And then Prabhupada translates the seven great sages, and before them, the four other great sages, and the Manus are born out of my mind. And all creatures in these planets descend from them. Born out of my mind. This is something to meditate on. Um, All creatures that descend from them, praja, this means progeny. In English, we say progeny. So, sons and daughters, your family. And so, this lets us think that the creatures that descend from Krishna are family members, are very close, have an intimate relation. But I guess we can also understand this to mean devotees, disciples. All those who descend in this parampara are disciples of Krishna, are devotees, family members and devotees at the same time. United in this most intimate love. So. The verse tells us that what flows from Krishna isn't just isn't just uh, let's say the blood, the DNA, to put it that way. What flows from Krishna is the loving energy too, the energy that creates that lets us be devotees, that lets us be disciples. This is the energy of. Love, this is the energy of Radharani. So what connects the entire genealogy is that energy. That's the link between each of the, the figures, each of the people, each of the souls in the genealogy of the universe. Krishna didn't create us as stones. Krishna created us as as jivas, as, as living, loving souls. Vishnu didn't do this. But Krishna, Bhagavan, in his loving personality, gave us soul. We're not Vishna, when you say Vishna Tattva, we're not, we're not principles of pure creation, we're, we're Radha Tattva, we're principles of 
of love. So in this way, Krishna went much farther than Vishnu. And this is kind of what and Prabhupada comments then, and this is a bit what he says. I read now, the Lord is giving a genealogical synopsis of the universal population. So he means he's giving a, a summary of all the souls, all the people that live, the universal population. Brahma, he says, is the original creature born out of the energy of the Supreme Lord, known as, <laughs> pardon me, Hiranyagarbha. Hiranyagarbha, this is a word for Vishnu, Mahavishnu. So Brahma, we talked about it many times before now. Brahma is the is the is the material reality, the sum of all things. It's God understood as reality. But the energy of Bhagavan is the energy of Radharani. Radharani's loving energy is the basis of all energy. So flowing through this creation is Radharani's energy. Then Prabhupada goes on and says, from Brahma, all seven great sages, all seven great wise men, and before them, four other great sages, Named Sanaka, Sananda, Sanatana, Sanat Kumara, and the Manus are manifested. Manus, this means the origins of mankind, the, the those who create mankind, Manus, Manavas. Prabhupada goes on, all these 25 great sages are known as the patriarchs of the living entities all over the universe. Patriarchs, the fathers. There are innumerable universes and innumerable planets within each universe. And each planet is full of population of different varieties. All of them are born of these 25 patriarchs. Brahma, so the creator of material reality, Brahma underwent penance. He was punished and had to wait. He underwent penance for 1,000 years of the demigods before he realized, by the grace of Krishna, how to create. So Krishna Bhagavan, the loving personality of God, revealed to Brahma the sense of the world, the meaning of the world. And that let him create the world. And Prabhupada goes on, then from Brahma, Sanaka, Sananda, Sanatana, <laughs> and Sanatkumara came out, then Rudra, and then the seven sages. And in this way, all the Brahmanas and Kshatriyas are born out of the energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Brahmanas, you remember, this is the intellectual class, the scholar class, and the Kshatriyas, this is the political leaders, the ruling class. So these two classes, the, 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 the highest two levels of, of humanity, were born out of this process, finally, in the end. And then finally, Prabhupada says, Brahma, 
is known as Pitamaha, the great father, the grandfather. And Krishna is known as Prapitamaha, the, the father of the grandfather. This is stated in chapter 11 of Bhagavad Gita. So kind of a technical verse about, about the family history of the universe. But now starts with verse 7, a really wonderful meditation on devotion, what a devotee is and what devotional service is. So it says, verse 7 says, Etam vibhutim yogam cha, maha yo veti tatvataha, so vilkalpene yogena, yugyat natra samshiya. And Prabhupada translates, He who knows in truth this glory and power of mine engages in unalloyed devotional service. Of this, there is no doubt. This is everything. This is Bhagavad Gita in one verse. He who knows in truth this glory and power of mine engages in unalloyed, unalloyed that means pure, pure devotional service. Of this there is no doubt. So the word in the verse, etam vibhutim, you remember the, the chapter is called vibhutya yoga, so of the, the story of opulence. So vibhutim means opulence, and then Prabhupada translates glory and power. But remember what we said about opulence, that it's not the external opulence, but the internal opulence, the depth and breadth of the soul in Krishna. And then well, yoga means, of course, service, devotional service. And then the yuyate means united. So when we know Krishna, we are united in bhakti. We are united in devotional service. So I want to remind you of the, the what we said two weeks ago, that I still meditate on, that knowing is, is loving. Knowing is loving. When we know completely, we're loving completely. To know is to love. There is no difference. When I'm filled with the knowledge of you, I have perfect knowledge of you, my heart is filled with you, that is what's called love, to love you. So when we know God, as the verse says, we are already in devotional service. Those who know the secret of bhakti are already in loving relation. It is not that we become very wise and become very realized and they say, okay, I know what I have to do. Now I have to become a bhakta. No. When you are understanding what God is, you're already loving. You're already in divine love. So this union, yujyata, it's a word related to yoga, union. This union, this loving relation, this feeling that we all feel a little bit, some of us more, some of us less. This feeling is the union with God. And the more that love grows, by caring for each other, 
by cooking for our children, by doing our work with, with, with good intentions. The more that love grows, the stronger the union with God becomes. It's not that we should be good, uh, loving people during the day and then go to temple and get close to God. It's that you're already coming close to God by caring for each other, by loving each other. They're inseparable. Loving anybody is coming closer to God. Anybody. Either your husband or your wife or your stra a stranger that you meet on the street. When you give that person love, you come closer to God. And you go deeper in, in your devotion relation with God. And we know this. And yeah, I want to go back to the verse. I'm sorry. Of this, there is no doubt. Prabhupada translates. There's no doubt that knowing will bring us to devotional service. So why is there no doubt? I wanted to ask. Why does, why does the author of this verse have to say this? It's not because he needs to remind us that it's true. He doesn't mean to say it's true. There's no doubt. It's true. He means to say that doubt disappears. He's not saying that you don't have to worry whether this Verse is true. He's saying that this feeling of wondering created by intelligence will be replaced by feeling created through love. So there will be no doubt because you won't care about the brain that doubts. The brain that doubts will be pushed aside by the heart that loves. So this is a really good lesson for everyday life as well. If we feel doubt about what's right and wrong, about the facts, about whether it's raining outside or whether uh, whether whether the it's a banana on my plate or an apple the answer to the question won't help us. No question about facts will help us. Only will help us the realization that the truth is in our hearts. And that the questions, if you call them questions, are about feelings, about love. When we realize that everything we need to know is in our hearts, then doubt disappears. Only when we see the world through our hearts and not through our intelligence will our doubt disappear. Our egos will disappear. Remember, we talked about fools before. And we, just, we said that there are two kinds of fools. There's the kind of fool that's wrong about the facts. So who says, well, the sun is shining in Paris, but actually it's raining in Paris. That's a fool. That's a kind of fool. But the more important fool is the one who thinks it's about facts. The, the, the bigger fool is the one who thinks that she can be happy by knowing all the facts. That the bigger fool is the one who thinks that learning enough facts 
will bring us happiness. But what we know, because we're not fools, <laughs> is that we have to let go of the questions and let the answers come to us through our feelings. They just come. They just come. We can't, we can't work harder. We can't ask more questions. The answers will just come. In my past life, I could never read enough books because I thought this would take me to this would take me to enlightenment. Enlightenment in the French sense of the word. <laughs> I would drink more coffee and more coffee, and I would pinch myself and stay awake at night and suffer because I never read enough books. I would bite my teeth together to stay awake and try and try and try. But now I see that it's not about biting teeth together. It's about softening. Softening. Softening eyes, softening hands, softening heart, and letting the truth flow in, letting the truth come. It just comes. That's what mercy is. That's what mercy means. It comes without, without us having to do anything. And it comes because, in a way, it's already there waiting for us in our hearts. It's just the, the big ego that I had reading all the books. See all the books back here. I read them all. And I didn't learn anything. It was when uh, I let this go that it starts to come. So here's, uh, sorry, we'll go back to Prabhupada now. He says, commenting on this verse about knowledge and devotion, he says, the highest summit of spiritual perfection is knowledge of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And again, I repeat and repeat, not facts, not knowledge of facts, knowledge of the soul, knowledge of, about what God is in the spiritual level. And that knowledge comes by opening the space in our own souls to see the divine there. So it's not factual knowledge, it's, it's um, felt knowledge, it's lived knowledge, it's loved knowledge. We always make a joke with Gurudev that I'm a philosopher, that's my job actually, here in Paris. And we joke that the philosophy is the biggest problem with bhakti. This has been my, uh, personally, my humbling experience. But philosophy, philosophy, this is a very nice word. It's uh, from old Greek language. And it has two parts, philosophy. It has philo, which means love and Sophia, which means knowledge or, or wisdom. So philosophy, we translate in the West, we translate a lover of knowledge. A philosopher is a lover of knowledge. The books, from the books, though. But I want to, I, I laughed this morning thinking about this. I think we'll make a new translation of the word philosopher. Not a, not a lover of knowledge, but a love knower. Someone who knows love. 
Philosopher is someone who knows love. I want to be a love knower. Not a, not a, a lover of no, knowledge, but a love knower. Sorry, this is probably difficult to translate into uh, Italian. And I want you to be love knowers too, to know love. I want you to be this new kind of philosopher, the one who knows love. So Prabhupada goes on, he says, unless one is firmly convinced of the different opulences of the Supreme Lord, he cannot engage in devotional service. What does convinced mean? It means believe, unless we strongly believe. And so this being convinced, it calls upon our, our spiritual relation to God. I repeat, the most important opulence of Krishna is internal, is the spiritual opulence, the spiritual greatness, the spiritual beauty, the beautiful loving generosity that's, that's represented in Radha Mohan. Loving again and again, every day, every day a love affair. That is what the meaning of life is, every day a love affair. And we can read in Velapakusmanjari and Naradasa Sudaniti what that love affair looks like. It's such beautiful gifts we have in these books. The meaning of life is a love affair, and we have two beautiful prayers that tell us what that love affair can look like, and and what we have to wait for when we clear away our the the the, the dirt, the dust from our, from our hearts. Prabhupada says, generally, people knew, know that God is great but they do not know in detail how God is great. Here are the details. So once again, generally people think God is something very special, but they think he's something very special in terms of external qualities. What he does, how strong he is, how beautiful he is physically, visually, But here we're talking about the internal qualities, the devotional qualities that help us link to God, that help us to see the God in us. And Prabhupada goes on, if one knows factually how God is great, then naturally he becomes a surrendered soul and engages himself in the devotional service. Of the Lord. You don't even have to try. You don't have to drink more coffee. You don't have to bite your teeth together. You don't have to hold your fists together and try harder to be a better devotee. It will happen naturally. And naturally, this devotional relationship will come. It's about, it's about letting it come, not going out and taking it, but letting the, the lover in you come. So if we only understand what God is, this is what Prabhupada is saying. If we understand uh, um, in what sense God is great, then we are already bhakta. You're already there. The more you understand God, the more you are in devotional service, the more you are uh, a bhakta. If we understand in our hearts what God is, then we, we become lovers of God. Again, 
Knowing is loving. If we know, we love. If we know, we love. So it's not a matter of saying, yes, now I know everything, so let's start loving. No. By knowing what's in your heart, you're already you're already a lover of God. So Prabhupada doesn't mean we need to understand the facts about God. How tall he is, what color hair, what kind of uh, pastimes he, he's, he's had. To understand God's opulence, we have to understand what um, opulence is. And opulence is the soul, the soul of God, the love in God, prema, divine love. Understand what divine love is. And then, then the questions disappear. Because we realize it's not about questions of fact. Opulence, understanding opulence is softening. Opening, uh, surrendering. And then this is what Prabhupada says, the next, the next line is, when one factually knows the opulences of the Supreme, there is no alternative but to surrender to him. It's automatic. There's no alternative. You're already there. Then hmm. he says, the, this factual knowledge can be known from the descriptions in Sri Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita and similar literatures. So there's lots that's told about Krishna in these books. And Prabhupada wants us to learn these things, to have knowledge. He's not against knowledge. But he wants us to read these in order to feel this. To feel what greatness means, to feel what opulence is. And to understand how to let go of external understanding and increase our internal understanding, increase our internal feeling. And Prabhupada goes on, in the administration of this universe, there are many de demigods distributed throughout the planetary system. And the chief of them are Brahma, Lord Shiva, and the four great Kumaras and other patriarchs. There are many forefathers of the population of the universe, and all of them are born of the Supreme Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna is the original forefather of all forefathers. So these are interesting things to know, the organization of the family. But what's more important to know is what is flowing through them. The energy of divine love that, that, that makes the universe possible. And that is the side of Radharani in Krishna's creation. Prabhupada continues, these are some of the opulences of the Supreme Lord. When one is firmly convinced of them, he accepts Krishna with great faith and without any doubt, and he engages in devotional service. So again, if we've understood what Krishna is, then we will surrender. 
because we know that there's no alternative. Then the world is only devotion. That's all there is. There's no other thought. There's no other thought in our minds and there's no other emotion in our hearts but but loving devotion. And Prabhupada says, all this particular knowledge is required in order to increase one's interest in the loving devotional service of the Lord. So the more knowledge of this kind we get, the more it will strengthen our our love, our, our devotion. So interest is there's nothing against factual knowledge. It can increase our loving knowledge. But in the end, loving knowledge, the knowledge of love, the experience of love will replace everything. Material knowing will be replaced by spiritual knowing. There'll be no interest for anything else. And finally, in the commentary here, um, Prabhupada says, one should not neglect to understand fully how great Krishna is. For by knowing the greatness of Krishna, one will be able to be fixed in sincere devotional service. Just wonderful. Again, we should we should seek in our meditation, in our daily lives, in our relation with others to understand the divine within, to understand the Krishna within, to understand the greatness of love, of divine and love. When we understand this, we will already be arrived as bhakta. We will already be in perfect, perfect devotion. So do your research. Research love in every corner of your life. Everything you do, look for the love. Then you're doing research on Krishna. Look for it in your relations, in your family, with your lover, with your colleagues, with strangers. Find that corner of love, seek it out, and you will be doing research on Krishna. And you will be coming closer and closer to pure, pure devotional service. Then we come to verse 10, uh, sorry, uh, 8, verse 8. And this is one that you want to write in your notebook. <laughs> this is um, a keeper. The commentary is kind of long, but the verse is so terribly inspiring. <laughs> Sarvasya Prabha, pra, pra, Prabhavo, Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo, Mata Sarvam Pravartate, Iti Matva Bajhanta Mam, Buddha Bhava Saman Vita. Now listen to this. I am the source of all spiritual and material worlds. Everything emanates from me. The wise who know this perfectly engage in my devotional service and worship me with all their hearts. Hmm. I am the source of all spiritual and material worlds. Everything emanates from me. The wise who know this perfectly engage in my devotional service and worship me with all their hearts. Once we know this, once we understand this, 
we only do devotional service. So Prabhupada is really telling the secrets of his beautiful heart here. And you know why? Because if you look carefully at the line, at the verse, Aham Savasya Prabhu, it actually says, I, Aham, everything am the source. I am the source of everything. It says, I'm the source of everything. But Prabhupada translates it by saying, I'm the source of spiritual and material words, worlds. So he wants us to understand the difference. He wants us to know that there's a spiritual world hiding behind this material world. He wants us to understand the difference between Siddha Deha and Sadika Deha. Siddha Vesh and Sadika Vesh. And then there's another Sanskrit word that I want to just show to you because it's maybe the most beautiful word you'll ever find in Sanskrit. It's the very last word of the verse. Bhava Samanvita. This means, well, Bhava, you know this word, love or, or feeling. And Samanvita means be, be knowing of it, conscious of it. So Prabhupada translates, fully conscious of love. The most beautiful words of any language in any time. So write this one word on a piece of paper and read it before you go to bed. My being fully conscious of love is what you will be once you know Krishna. And Prabhupada comments, a learned scholar who has studied the Vedas perfectly and has information from authorities like Lord Chaitanya and who knows how to apply these teachings can understand that Krishna is the origin of everything in both the material and spiritual worlds. And because he knows this perfectly, he becomes firmly fixed in the devotional service of the Supreme Lord. So this, this kind of knowing, it's nothing that a scholar can do, nothing that a philosopher can do. <laughs> we can read and learn, learn Sanskrit and study and memorize. And that's all good. But until we surrender to this truth about Krishna, that he created a spiritual world in addition to the material world, only when we give ourselves to that, then the truth will come. And then we'll be in pure devotional service. Prabhupada says, he can never, someone who realizes this, can never be deviated by any amount of nonsensical commentaries or by fools. Remember, the fool is not the one who gets the facts wrong. The fool is the one who thinks the question is about facts. And it's not about facts, it's about feeling. One who is not a fool knows that it's about feeling, it's about love. And now Prabhupada cites some places from Srimad Bhagavatam. He says, all Vedic literature agrees that Krishna is the source of Brahma. Shiva, and all other demigods. In the Artarva Veda, it is said, sorry, I said it was uh, Bhagavatam, it's not, it's from the Veda. In the Artarva Veda, it is said, it was Krishna who in the beginning instructed Brahma in Vedic knowledge 
and who disseminated Vedic knowledge in the past. Then again, it is said, then the Supreme Personality Narayana, Narayana desired to create living entities. And again, it is said, from Narayana, Brahma is born. And from Narayana, the patriarchs are also born. From is born. From Narayana, the eight Vasus are born. From Narayana, the eleven Rudras are born. From Narayana, the twelve Adityas are born. So essentially, Prabhupada is showing the evidence from the Shastras, from the scriptures, that Bhagavan, Krishna, as personality of Godhead, is the origin of all these things. He continues, it is said in the same Vedas, the son of Devaki, Krishna, is the Supreme Personality. And then it is said, in the beginning of the creation, there was only the Supreme Personality, Narayana. There was no Brahma, no Shiva, no fire, no moon, no stars in the sky, no sun. There was only Krishna, who creates all and enjoys all. And Prabhupada continues, in the many Puranas, it is said that Lord Shiva was born from the highest, the Supreme Lord, Krishna. And the Vedas say that it is the Supreme Lord, the creator of Brahma and Shiva, who is to be worshipped. In the Moksha Dharma, Prabhupada says, Krishna also says, the patriarchs, Shiva, and others are created by me. Though they do not know that they are created by me, because they are deluded by my illusory energy. And then more, uh, more evidence from Prabhupada. In Varaha Purana, it is said, Narayana is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And from him, Brahma was born, from whom Shiva was born. Lord Krishna is the source of all generations, and he is called the most efficient cause of everything. He says that because everything is born of me, I'm the original source of all Everything is under me. No one is above me. So he's repeating the individual, the original verse. This is the traditional way of arguing in, in, um, in this tradition that we cite verses from, from the Vedas or from other scriptures that can prove what we're we're saying. And then uh, finally. Prabhupada says, there is no supreme controller other than Krishna. And then he repeats, one who understands Krishna in such a way, from a bona fide spiritual master, and from Vedic literature, who engages all his energy in Krishna consciousness, becomes a truly learned man. But here again, we need to understand what we what he means by understand, right? That he, that we're that we're, that we're studying the internal experience. We're studying the soul of Krishna. We're studying the loving relation of Aradha Mohan. And that's how we can ob obtain Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness, this is Prabhupada's way of saying one-pointedness. Full, full consciousness of Radha Mohan. So the highest scholar is the one who understands that knowing is not facts, but that knowing is, is loving. 
And Prabhupada says, in comparison to him, to this, to this kind of scholar, others who do not know Krishna properly are but fools. Remember, a fool is the one who doesn't understand what the question is. And the fool doesn't know that he's a fool. Only a fool, says Prabhupada, would consider Krishna to be an ordinary man. A Krishna conscious person should not be bewildered, confused. A Krishna conscious person should not be bewildered. Krishna by fools. All right. Something wrong there. Hmm. A Krishna conscious person should not be bewildered by fools. That's what's missing. He should avoid all unauthorized commentaries and interpretations of Bhagavad Gita and proceed in Krishna consciousness with determination and firmness. Okay, I'm watching the clock a little bit. Maybe we start on one more verse and see how far we go. Verse 9 describes for us what a pure devotee is. So it's a very important one, very interesting. Machita madgata prana, podyantaha parasparam, katyantash chamam nityam, tusyanti cha ramanti cha. And Prabhupada translates the thoughts of my of my pure devotees dwell in me. Their lives are surrendered to me. And they derive great satisfaction and bliss, enlightening one another and conversing about me. It's a description of what a devotee is. It's a description of what we are. We're thinking always about God. We're focused on the divine. Once again, when I say we're focused on God, we're thinking about God. We're not thinking about uh, the president of the world sitting on a cloud with a long beard. When we're thinking about God, we're thinking about the God in others. We're thinking about the God in our brothers and sisters. We're thinking about the divine in the nature, in the animals. We're thinking about the divine in our food, the divine in our music, the divine in our poetry. It's not a, it should not be an alienating experience to think about God. Thinking about God is the most familiar experience. If it's strange for you to think about God, then you're not thinking about God. God is your best friend, your closest lover. So if there is resistance to your meditation, if you feel odd, if you feel strange, then find the path in your meditation to where you feel the most comfortable, the most normal, the most unviolent, the most uh, peaceful. And then you're thinking about God. Then you're purifying yourself. Find peace in your meditation, and then you'll find God. That's where it is. It's not a faraway place. It's the closest place to us. God is sitting right next to us, and that's why we can't see him. <laughs> that's why we can't find him. 
right next to us, right inside us. So the verse says that it's very nice we, when we come to this place of thinking, dwelling in me, thinking about God, about Krishna, then we'll have happiness, then we'll have pleasure, because we'll have that peace. So the map of our meditation should be the map towards peacefulness. And then there's nothing else. Prabhupada says, pure devotees, whose characteristics are mentioned here, engage themselves fully in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. Their minds cannot be diverted from the lotus feet of Krishna. So devotees who are focused on, on God take shelter. And remember, we talked about shelter before. This means taking shelter from everything that distracts from focusing on our loving devotion. Taking shelter means uncovering our hearts, cleaning away the material coverings, cleaning away the distractions, cleaning away our souls. And then Prabhupada also said their talks are solely on transcendental subjects. And again, it's not because we force ourselves to do this, to talk about devotional subjects. It's because that's all we want to talk about. It's because we can't think of anything else. Prabhupada says, the symptoms of the pure devotees are described in this verse specifically. Devotees of the Supreme Lord are 24 hours daily engaged in glorifying the pastimes of the Supreme Lord. So like Gurudev says, 24-7. But again, I can't say it enough. You cannot force this. You have to, but you have to be there when it comes. Your heart has to be receptive. Your heart has to be open and it will come. And you have to be patient. Because we're already alive 24 7. We're already, we already have a soul 24 7. We already have divinity 24 7. We already have prema 24 7. So we don't need to <clears throat> go out and get these things. But we need to shape our own hearts that, that we can be open to them. We don't need to work harder. In a way, we need to work less hard. We need to stop working. It's the work that's blocking. So this divine love, it comes from inside. So we need to relax. This is so difficult in our lives. But this is what realization means. Realization isn't, oh, I finally saw the, uh, the dictator sitting on the cloud with a, with a beard. No, realization means that you realize you already had it. That you've been moving around the world, carrying divinity inside your soul and not enjoying it. Realizing, realization means realizing that you already have divine love. You already have it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to suffer for it. It's been already been given to you. This is what mercy means. It's already there for no reason. 
it's always already given to you. It's only you and me standing in the way of seeing that. That's what realization is. It's not finally seeing the vision of something. It's realizing who you are. Hmm. Well, Prabhupada goes on then and says, their hearts, the devotees' hearts, and souls are constantly submerged in Krishna, and they take pleasure in discussing him with other devotees. So there's pleasure in it, in this discussion with sharing, sharing the love with others. Prabhupada says, in the preliminary stage, the first stage of devotional service, they relish, devotees relish, the transcendental pleasure from the service itself. So this is what I mean, work is not work. We stop working, we do everything for pleasure but not material pleasure, spiritual, transcendental pleasure. And he goes on, in the mature stage, they are actually situated in love of God. What an amazing word. You're situated in love. You're sitting in love. Maybe this is why we talk about ocean so much. There's an ocean of love, an ocean of nectar. You're situated in love of God. Where you are now is in the love of God. And once situated in that transcendental position, um, Prabhupada says, devotees can relish, can enjoy the highest perfection, which is exhibited by the Lord in his abode. And then we come to this metaphor of the seed that you find in the uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita. Lord Chaitanya likens, he compares transcendental devotional service to the sowing of a seed, to planting a seed in the heart of the living entity. It's going to grow inside you. There are, he says, innumerable living entities traveling throughout the different planets of the universe. And out of them, there are a few who are fortunate enough to meet a pure devotee and get the chance to understand devotional service. And now you know he's talking about you. You are the fortunate ones. We are the fortunate ones because we got to meet each other. We got to meet Gurudev. We got to meet Jainanda Maharaj. We got to meet all these devotees, and we, we took the express lane on the spiritual freeway to increasing our love. The love we feel is already so much greater than it is in those people who have not had the fortune of meeting Gurudev or meeting brothers and sisters like we have. So we're very, very fortunate. And gratitude is part of our gratitude is part of our service. Being grateful, saying thank you. Thank you. And then Prabhupada continues: this devotional service is just like a seed. And if it is sown in the heart of living entity, and if he goes on hearing and chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, then that seed fructifies, it grows, just as the seed of a tree fructifies with regular watering. So there's something growing inside us. Prabhupada says, the spiritual plant of devotional service gradually grows and grows until it penetrates the covering of the material universe. 
and enters into the Brahmayoti effulgence in the spiritual sky. So it breaks through the material covering in our hearts and enters into the spiritual level. In the spiritual sky, also that plant grows more and more until it reaches the highest planet. So even if we're realized and have put one foot in the spiritual world, even for an instant, we keep growing. We keep growing our, our soul. Until it reaches the highest planet, which is called Kolaka Vrindavana, the supreme planet of Krishna. And then Prabhupada says, ultimately, in the end, the planet, the plant takes shelter under the lotus feet of Krishna and rests there. Gradually, as a plant grows fruits and flowers, that plant of devotional service also produces fruits. So it means that as we grow spiritually, we create more sweetness in the world, more fruit. We, we create more devotional service, and we help and strengthen other devotees who are doing the same. Prabhupada continues, the watering process in the form of chanting and hearing goes on. This plant of devotional service is fully described in Chaitanya Charitamrita. It is explained there, Prabhupada says, that when the complete plant takes shelter under the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord, one becomes fully absorbed in love of God. Then he cannot live even for a moment without being in contact with the Supreme Lord, just as a fish cannot live without water. In such a state, the devotee actually attains the transcendental qualities in contact with the Supreme Lord. Srimad Bhagavatam is also full of such narration about the relationship between the Supreme Lord and his devotees. And therefore, Srimad Bhagavatam is very dear to devotees. And now Prabhupada says something very interesting. Listen, in this narration, there is nothing about material activities sense gratification or liberation. There's nothing about it in all of Srimad Bhagavatam. I did not realize this. It's only the narration in which the transcendental nature of the Supreme Lord and his devotees is described. Thus, Prabhupada concludes, the realized souls in Krishna consciousness take continual pleasure in hearing such transcendental literatures, just as a young boy and girl take pleasure in association. Lovely. And that's the end of the commentary for verse 9. And we'll stop here now for today. And um, if there's anyone who would like to share, that would be very nice too. Rade, rade. Rade, rade. Thank you, so nice. I come, I, I'm now uh, very busy in the material things in my life <laughs> as a, a little older lady. <laughs> very big steps in a new phase. And uh, then I sit here the first time and it's run in my thoughts. <laughs> nice, mm. nice, nice. But I was not in the heart. And after a few minutes, when you speak about the love and the and the heart, I'm so touched uh, heartfully. 
Thank you very much. It's so important for me <laughs> to hear your your uh, special way to bring us to the heart in the love. I have also a little um, in my life many many book books. I have liked it thirty years, thirty five. Was a teacher from the brain mm -hmm. neurobiology and uh, small way okay. I work uh, behind uh, with handicapped people uh, my whole life and have uh, interesting what why it is why I so feel and when the, the children is is crazy why it is and then uh, then uh, yeah shortly I have my way in my business also for make together the love and the knowing but I have now know that I ending here in this class but it was mm -hmm. a preparating for me for go for go uh, we like a preparating and now it's so very wonderful that I have nothing to know <laughs> in my relationships with other people I, I must not have right I, I have nothing no but I have a feeling for the love for others and this is not from me this is from Radha Krishna and thank you so much I like it mm. especially you, so you come from the philosophy and <laughs> thank you very much yeah it's mm. it's mm. thank you thank you dear All right, well, if no other sharing, then we'll stop here. Oh, it's Tainanda. Yeah, good. Uh, not hearing. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear? Uh, good. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful uh, sharing and wonderful uh class and uh, today after hearing your your sharing this uh, text verse ahan sarvasha prababo mata sarvam prabartate iti matva bhajante mam buddha baba saman bitaha mm. So this bus, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I got a new insight. So Krishna coming from all material universe and also spiritual universe means uh, in Sadaka Deha and Siddha Deha, we, are, we have given the place for the service uh, the, the place for the seva mm. in Sadaka Deha and Siddha Deha. And this you mentioned, Iti Matva Bhajante Man, Buddha Baba Saman Bidaha. Baba Sama, I don't know real meaning Sanskrit because I'm fool, but I'm feeling this Baba Saman Bidaha. According to our Baba, our feeling, according to our Lhasa. So we are, uh, this worshiping means we, we, we are do some seba for Radha and Moham. So this bus, so we may understand this bus also we, we may understand Manjari Baba. Of course, not really directly Manjari Baba. According to our Baba, and sa same Baba, we can worship Krishna and Radha Mohan. And this service, the place is material world, means Sadaka Deha. And spiritual world also Siddha, Siddha Deha. Mm. So this is like, uh, so if we 
I was, I, I feel this birth, we can kind of, uh, interpret, you know, inter, we can understand different Baba. Every living entity, uh, worshiping according to our Baba. And also Baba Samambitaha might be, we may say, Raga, Anuraga. So we have uh, this Baba and Anuraga. Hmm. So according to our Baba, also Radha Mohan replicated. So this, I never think about it, but uh, you know, this, we need uh, this material world and spiritual world because we are doing seva for the pleasure of Radha Mohan. So you mentioned mm -hmm. any activity is for pleasure of Radha Mohan. Mm -hmm. So that's I was feeling this, oh my God, this is spiritual and material world. Mm -hmm. We are got by the mercy of Guru Dev, we are got the place for the seva, the sadaka mm -hmm. deha and the sitta deha. Rade, rade. So nice, so nice, Chananda, thank you. Very, very important. So the way that Prabhupada is reading this, it makes the space for seva. It's a safe space for our service. Then thank you so much, everybody, and we'll see you next week.